Hi everyone, hello, 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 welcome to the Gama Sutra Twitch channel. My name is Bryant Francis, uh, the invisible uh, invisible voice inside your head. Um, you might say I am the narrator of this stream. No, don't, uh, don't say that. Um, I'm joined by a bunch of wonderful folks down in the lower left-hand corner of the screen. Um, one of them is Alex Waro, who works for me at Gama Sutra. Alex, could you say hi and introduce yourself? Ooh, uh, 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 my name is Alex Waro. Uh, I'm an editor here at GamaSutra.com, and we are joined today by two much more interesting and fascinating folks. Uh, would you two gentlemen tell the audience who you are, what you do, in any order? <laughs> uh, I'm Amir Rao. I'm the studio director of Supergiant Games. Uh, I mostly coordinate the work on the team, and uh, I do uh, design work on our games. Yeah, hey, and I'm Greg Kasavin. I'm a creative director at Supergiant. I do uh, writing and and some design work as well. We're we're a team of we're a team of twelve. So Amir's being modest uh, <laughs> in the sense that uh, everybody, yeah, with with twelve people, we all we all get to do a bunch of different things. That that keeps things pretty interesting for us. Yeah. yeah. Um, we're already getting some great comments, so before we jump into the uh, um, hopefully uh, talk where we get to learn more about the development of Pyre, um, I just want to remind everyone of the comments, if you have any questions, especially questions about game development, um, we encourage you to ask them so that Alex and I can pose them to our uh, esteemed guests today. Um, right now, in case you aren't familiar, Pyre is the newest um, role-playing game, kind of uh, I guess role-playing games is the word I'll use for now, but um, from the folks at Supergiant Games, um, you are part of a band of misfits um, ver wandering through exile to try and find a way home, um, and right now uh, I am somewhere in a uh, evil-looking bog trying to get help from the mysterious client who has been sponsoring our expedition. Um, Greg and Amir, would you mind sort of taking us through the earliest parts of Pyre? And you and I talked about this a while ago in an interview from PAX last year. Um, what, what, what was the first thing you realized was fun about this game or what was worth pursuing on a game development track? Yeah, Amir, Amir what do you think? Because we were, uh, we were kind of going in along the separate trajectories. There was like, yeah. what, what was your first experience with like the... What was the aha like gameplay prototyping moment? Because that happened uh, pretty early on. Yeah, I don't recall it exactly. <laughs> <laughs> about two like weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, about a month before the game shift. Yeah, I really felt like it was coming together. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think I think I think for for me personally, the experience of developing our games, uh, the gameplay of our games, and the and the concepts of it are so so iterative um, that it is those moments it's not usually any week it's like after two or three months you look at it and you're like oh my god this is kind of a this is kind of a game now um and it has concepts and it's starting to have strategies um and it's starting to feel like something um and so yeah i guess i guess it was probably you know some of the earliest just earliest prototypes when uh i think moments i remember are like when the characters really started to feel different um, and they started to have roles within the rights gameplay um, that I really, I really thought it might uh, be going somewhere for me. Yeah, there, there was also like I, there's something I really want to say in response to this, but it's yeah. I, I think with the game being so new for me, it's like such kind of spoiler territory that I'm reluctant to, uh, uh, unless unless you feel it's fine to just straight up, yeah, I kind of I feel bad like straight up <laughs> spoiling the game when it just came out. Um, but but something related to kind of the the structure of the game, and uh, the nature of, of the players' kind of relationship with the characters uh, in their band, um, there were aspects of that where we we started to kind of get the connection between the characters uh, outside of the rights gameplay and in the rights gameplay, and how you could like interact with them just under a more casual set of circumstances instead of just kind of constantly in the heat of the moment. Um, and that started to feel uh, pretty interesting to us uh, pretty early on, because uh, because we wanted to have the have this game where you felt like you, almost like a big uh, fantasy road trip sort of thing, where you're um, in in close quarters with these characters and uh, are able to kind of get closer to them. Yeah, I um, something we were talking about before the stream started, Brian and I, is uh, how to talk about this game quickly 
Like, how do you shorthand <laughs> to say what is pyre, yeah. right? Uh, and I don't necessarily think in in like really in general that needs to be solved. Like, I think it's probably best to to talk about things at length. But um, you know, like trying to def- like what I, what I find interesting is is when we were trying to say like what is this? Is it an action RPG? Is it an RPG? Is it a sports game? Like, what shines forth is what we most prioritize and 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 sort of savor about the game's design itself. Me, I end up landing on like tactical real time team based sports RPG, which is too many <laughs> words. Uh, so like. Uh, rather than try to pick uh, uh, like a pigeonhole to put this into, um, let's talk about like the inspirations and influences that led you to that, like through that prototyping phase. Like how, like what were you trying to do with this? How were you? What were you trying to make that yeah. became Pyre? Yeah, the, it, it started from a, like a pretty simple place for us, which is just the the desire to make a game with an ensemble cast of characters. Uh, like we we've really enjoyed the the world building aspects of. Of the games that we've made, um, just from the from the get go with Bastion, our first game, it was a game where we just you know a small group of people we all just got together and made stuff up, uh, and but it got a really excellent response you know as far as the the kind of the the world and the characters and uh, the how how the narrative and the gameplay all fit together. So those are things we really care about the the kind of synthesis of the thematic substance of our game and 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 the play experience itself. Um, but when it comes down to it, we also just really like creating characters and settings and so forth. Uh, but our, our first two games with Bastion and Transistor, they have these kind of very, uh, very kind of um, almost like narrow stories taking place over a, a kind of a, uh, particularly with Transistor, takes place over a pretty short period of time, has kind of a very limited cast of characters, and, and the story is very focused on kind of a single protagonist character that you play as through the duration um, of the journey. So uh, having having made two games kind of in that vein, we were really excited by the idea of, of a game with kind of no central protagonist per se, where you meet a variety of different characters of all shapes and sizes and leanings and dispositions and that they could all interact in a variety of different ways and put you in this environment where these characters would all have their personal hopes and dreams but they were in a situation where they would have a shared, like some sort of shared goal that they were trying to accomplish. So everyone would have to kind of navigate that together and um, have to it, basically be in a situation where they have to rely on one another in order to succeed. So that was really interesting to us uh, narratively, and it was really interesting to us gameplay-wise. So it informed aspects of, of this kind of ritual competition called the rites where you have control over several characters at a time. That was really key to the whole thing. And, and uh, the characters are kind of like uh, often, often helpless as one character, you know, has to sort of operate individually one at a time. So they, they quite literally are really depending on one another uh, during the course of these competitions. So all that stuff, that's kind of how it started to evolve. But that's the, the simple point of origin. Uh, for us is the the multi-character story mm. yeah i was hoping to hear some mention of nba jam in there but I understand. <laughs> uh, i'll move on uh there uh, normally we, we would dig into this a bit deeper but i feel a bit guilty already there are some good questions in chat i'm just gonna grab one real quick uh do, do, do. i feel like we've talked about this before actually but um let's just go over it real quickly again nerd Migo 79 wants to know about the structure of Supergiant, those 12 fine folks have you ever thought of getting bigger as a company i know greg we've talked about this before on other projects um how do you guys feel now after wrapping up your second game as a 12 person studio i mean i think uh we really value the creative chemistry and the vibe of working on a really small team and with the people at Supergiant. You know, many of us have been working together for like a really, really long time for ten or more years. Um, but which is, I guess, not that long in human year in human in human lifetime. But in it, for a career, it's pretty long. Um, and so I think that is like part of the part of like the secret sauce or whatever of what we do is just our ability to to work together and to learn together and grow as a team. Um, and I I think that's sort of like expressed actually in this game um, um, pretty well. Uh, but I think we are still um, we're still like uh, doing a lot of things uh, <laughs> that that expand the scope of what we're doing by multiplying our efforts by like partnering with other people. So um, like a lot more people 
I think, were probably involved in the making of Pyre than any of our previous games, from everything from um, uh, the QA help we got, uh, voice actors uh, that were involved in the game, uh, all that kind of stuff. So uh, there were a lot of a lot of a lot more people, I think, who who had a hand in in Pyre, um, even if it was for a really specific uh, part of the fantasy road trip um, that you, you know than we've ever sort of uh, worked with before. Mm. Yeah, I um, I'd be curious to dig into more into the contractor situation. But you mentioned QA specifically. Uh, yeah. Something something again. Brian and I were talking about before we started is, um, you know, we we know the Bastion. You guys worked with the publisher for some of that. But for Transistor and Pyre, you know, as far as I know, that's been self published all the way. Um, yeah. So I kind of want to know. You know, typically uh, these days, especially like indies, value publishers mainly for their support in QA. And marketing, and you guys have done that on your own. I wonder why you made that choice, and sort of what impact it's had on your development process. Yeah, I mean, uh, Greg can probably speak a bit to, to our uh, how much we value our independence. But mm-hmm. on the QA side specifically, like Morgan is is you know does a lot of our QA and and some of our in- internal production work as well, and he's um, he's integral to the to the stuff we do there. Um, and he's also working with an external team who we've worked with for a really long time. Uh, called the Research Centaur, who's helped, um, if they're watching, hello, <laughs> who's helped us with uh, a QA for a really long time, all the way stretching back to Bastion. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, we tend to to work with our small chosen group of people. Um, and it's one of those things, because we do self-publish, that you know you do need to develop competency and you have to be your own publisher and you have to be able to provide your own support um, and tech support and everything else. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's that's a version of that answer, but it's it's all really all, as much as possible when we can do things ourselves, and we there's like a really vested interest in our company becoming good at that stuff, um, even if even if that service could be provided by someone else, um, it's it's always good if if we can learn um, what's involved and get good at it. Yeah, that's pretty much uh, why we decide to give it a shot in a nutshell, right? Uh, after yeah. with with Transistor, we wanted to see if we could do it. Um, uh, each of our each of our games has been. It, it, they're all kind of self-funded, so it's it's just us, um, you know, the yeah. the people in the room, deciding what the game is, having to build it. Um, it, it. It stood to reason that we would then, in turn, be responsible for the act of like putting it out into the world, uh, supporting it, uh, all those kinds of things. Uh, as as Amir said, it it really just kind of feels good to for us to be able to do that ourselves, to take like direct responsibility for it. Um, uh, uh, it just uh, feels uh, very, uh, I guess, in a word, it feels very honest. It's like this is this is the game that we made. We stand by it, um, and uh, we we get to put it out there and kind of learn, yeah, learn all those different facets of the entire process, start to finish. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I don't want to. First of all, I don't want to trivialize this. Like, I'm about to compare you to the studio, and like, that's <laughs> kind of unfair, right? Every studio is unique, and like, there's no, you know, but. Uh, you know, when I look at a, at a at another sort of you know sort of small to medium sized indie outfit that uh, consistently, uh, almost quietly churns out really interesting, unique games every couple of years, I think of Clay, right, mm. uh, and and lots of others. But like Clay in particular is interesting because they uh, they have been eager to experiment with sort of like non traditional or actually now they're pretty traditional ways of game development, including like early access and that kind of thing. And I noticed Supergiant has been. Uh, very focused on, as you just said, like doing everything itself, like producing a new game every couple of years, finished all that. And I wonder, like, why have you? Has there been a conscious decision to avoid systems like like early access and that kind of thing in your development process? Yeah, that, that, that's a really interesting question. I, I mean, uh, conscious decision to avoid is like a strong way of putting it. Right. I think, I think, um, I think it's like a really powerful. Uh, way of developing games that works really well for certain types of games and certain studios in, in certain situations. I think for us that we've made games a certain way and we've we've had the the privilege of being able to self fund our own projects. Like we see it as something that like we haven't had to use uh, essentially. Um, the, now some some studios I think have have used uh, early access as a means of I, I, or I guess you know I was referring more to Kickstarter than to early access. There, mm. yeah. uh, I think the reason uh, to speak more specifically to early access, I think given the nature of the games we've made thus far that are like uh, narrative-focused games with like a specific beginning and a specific end, uh, we we have felt thus far that those don't lend themselves like super well 
to early access. Uh, I know that there have been some exceptions to that, but that's been uh, our feeling on the subject that like the atmosphere uh, of our games and kind of the storytelling of our games is so important that it's really just not ready to be presented, uh, in our opinion, until the game is essentially complete. So I think it's more to do with the kinds of games that we've made, at least thus far, than it is uh, any kind of like a, like a ton of us are, you know, we, we played a ton of like Darkest Dungeon and stuff like that. We have no like uh, moral qualms or whatever. Like yeah. many of my best friends are early access <laughs> games, um, that sort of thing. Like it's, it, it just hasn't been a good fit for the stuff we've made thus far. But, you know, we've only made three games uh, and one of them only came out two or three days ago. So uh, <laughs> who's, who's to say, you know, what, what the future holds? We're, we're open to whatever. Nice. I uh, I can keep going, but Brian, you've been you've been uh, happily playing along in the background there. Do you have any? Do you want to slip in some questions? Anything like pressing on your mind yeah, there? Yeah. Um. Let's talk about. Um. I think uh, a lot of uh, indies sort of benefit from sort of sometimes getting to crack open the shell of other people's work and like say, okay, what's going on under the surface here? Um. Could you share what was one of the technical challenges that you don't think anyone would notice right away in this game? But I'm curious, like, what was there's obviously a huge amount of creative and design challenges managing these choices, and what's kind of the first technical hurdle that you think comes to mind when you think about your work on this game? Man, does anything come to mind, Amir? Ne- neither of us is like a... We have two engineers at yeah. Supergiant, and either Am- Amir or I are one of them, but I, I, Amir, can you think of anything? Uh, technical. Yeah. That's a, I, it was, not really... <laughs> it was kind of the whole... I mean, yeah, the it's, hard, like, it's yeah. hard to... like nothing i don't know that anything jumps out it sounds like for for either one of us but like since the game itself was was so different from our last game uh there were a lot of a lot of it was just kind of figuring out what the entire structure the pro- like there are a lot of like tools changes for example yeah i don't know that any one of those things was in and of itself a big technical challenge but like in in aggregate the amount of stuff we needed to kind of figure out, uh, yeah. both from a design and technical standpoint, it all went hand in hand. But we're not really the type of studio that like oh. we don't we don't typically have like months long you know technological R and D type things because being a small team, it's so important to us just to be able to build things immediately. So we try to set our sights uh, appropriately and build what we can, and that that sort of becomes a a natural constraint uh, in, a, in a really like pleasing way, I would say on our, on our on our development process. It just means that we move really quickly, but um, you know, it, it also means that we don't like develop like amazing hair shaders or whatever, <laughs> um, w- which I I have tons of respect for, and many of my friends are hair shaders. And <laughs> I'm gonna keep going with this, yeah. <laughs> but you know what I mean. We're not like I don't think we see ourselves as like a technology company or, or something like that. There's still many uh, technical challenges that we have to solve along the way, but we don't like. It's not like a starting point for, for the kind of games we, we want to make. Yeah, Amir, I did, have. Does a... that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so. Um, in terms of like just general process, then we'll, we'll we'll jump back from the technical ins and outs. Like uh, something I think maybe you both can speak to, both as um, writers and designers and that kind of thing. Is like when I look at Supergiant's past work, I can. I don't know if I'm right or not, but I can imagine the course of design and um, sort of like narrative um, creation, right? I can see like, oh, this is an action RPG. It's going to have this stuff in it. We're going to write a story in a world to, that, that makes sense that we can explore with that kind of template. Not to say that it's a template, but just, you know, it makes sense. I can see that in Transistor as well. Here, I, I can't tell what came first, the mechanics or the story. Like, the, like there's something so unique about the idea of playing mystical three-on-three basketball with auras that like i can't quite tell was that did that start as a story that was then fleshed out in a prototype or a prototype that fleshed out with narration or just some weird how did that come together in like yeah. you know. it's symbiotic right uh, amir it's like it, yeah. it happens it uh, it's the the chicken and egg analogy is apt because you know the fun thing about chicken and egg is like people have that sort of paradoxical relationship to that as an idea of you can't you can't really say uh, which one came before the other. Um, so we, I mean, a lot of those ideas uh, happen pretty directly in parallel um, on this game because we, we do start um, 
I, I, I should let Amir speak to this more, but at the beginning of one of our projects, it, it just tends to involve um, a lot of it, like all of us in the room just talking about what we call our preoccupations, which can be anything. It can be a narrative idea, it can be a bit of technology, it can be like a specific gameplay idea or a tonal idea. And so it's just kind of like, what is everyone thinking about? What does everyone want to do and pursue in their own uh, discipline or just in general as an idea? Uh, and we start to look for a common ground there. Um, and so the common ground uh, in the case of Pyre was this kind of multi-character uh, story where these characters uh, go through this mystical journey to enlightenment and have to, have to kind of rely on each other to achieve something. So the rely on each other, the, the, this sort of team-based aspect uh, was something that was uh, really intriguing to us and then you know, started to become more specific in, in both the narrative uh, and, the, and the gameplay prototyping kind of at the, at the same time. And some of those efforts you know, happen, you, they happen in parallel, but that means they're happening independently. And then you know, all throughout the process, we're also looking for the opportunities to, to tie everything together as, as strongly as possible. Um, but it, 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 you know, that probably also makes it sound more structured than it probably is in reality. Like the reality of early prototyping is, it's a lot of throwing stuff at a wall and seeing what sticks. Uh, honestly, you're you're throwing a lot of stuff out, uh, not because it's bad, but because maybe it doesn't fit or it's not kind of, it doesn't feel quite right with everything else. So a lot of it is um, kind of touchy feely that way of us uh, kind of examining what we have um, and see, seeing what we think about it. Like we don't, we don't always know what we want until we build it, um, especially early on when it's kind of blue sky and we're just uh, kind of dreaming up these ideas. So um, pre-production for us, like just coming up with these concepts uh, certainly takes us, uh, it takes us some time. Yeah, I, um, uh, we can keep going, but I think now's a good chance to, to ask something. I think you've, you've probably been asked a fair bit, which is uh, Brian just lost a match here on the oh, stream yeah. and uh, yeah, he's yeah. still going so let's talk about that uh that progression system the idea that uh the team can win or lose and still keep going i want to know sort of um yeah. why why that interested you and sort of how you how you balance how you make those wins and losses feel meaningful while still not tying them to the overall progression yeah it's a really good question i think this is like something that uh speaking of preoccupations i feel like this is um, a, a version of an idea that, that Amir and I must have been talking about for, for yeah, like the 10 years that we've known each other or something <laughs> like that. Like, even back when, because we, uh, um, myself and Amir and Gavin, who are the two co-founders of Supergiant, we were all working at Electronic Arts uh, on, on Command and Conquer games, games about, like, tanks blowing, blowing stuff up and stuff. Yeah. Uh, but we were always really interested in this idea of, like, a game that can just sort of move forward no matter what. There isn't, like, repeated content per se you just kind of press onward and the story is going to react to what happens and it's not about like looping through dialogue trees forever it's just always uh, uh hurtling forward um so and and we were finally able to realize a, a version of that in in this game um i think what made it so kind of compelling to us with this game was that it felt so in theme um to have these characters like narratively in situations where they have to recover from their failures and recover from their losses and pick themselves up that's that's part of the reason why it's it's like at its nature like a it's like a non-lethal competition that they're in it, it's not you know it's not a bunch of guys like brutally killing each other because if if your characters are dead they can't learn anything from that anymore like as a player you know if you play dark souls or whatever um each time you get killed by like a dude with red eyes you're going to come back and having learned a little bit more and you'll get a little bit better and a little bit better until you finally beat that guy and you're learning. But, but that's outside of the scope of the narrative. Um, whereas we were really interested in, in having the characters actually be able to like respond uh, to, the, to their losses here. Oh, I see uh, a, a, fine, a fine scene with uh, Tizo here. We're not talking about that. <laughs> I, like, I like this scene. Uh, yeah, Tizo yeah. is making, uh, making a little joke here. But yeah, um, the, you know... Uh, that's that's kind of where we wanted to go with it and, and where we make the stakes uh, feel significant, I, I think, is where um, it matters to the characters and it could actually affect uh, which characters uh, remain in the game um, or not, um, to, to not to give away, I guess, a little bit 
uh, for those who haven't played it yet. So, um, but, uh, but it's very much, again, kind of in, in theme with the story that it's not, uh, it's not about, it's a game that asks you to consider, uh, the, the outcomes of, of these situations that you're in. Um, and in, in many, in many competitive situations, there's zero sum. If I'm against you and I win, that means you lose. And it's a game that invites you to, to consider what that means uh, from, from multiple uh, points of view. Mm. Um, to, to hopefully, you know, just be interesting in its own right, but also, also I think, just to kind of create a particular tone that we wanted to achieve a, a more, I think, a, somewhat of a more uplifting tone uh, as compared with our last game, which, which kind of uh, went, went a little bit darker uh, tonally. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think it's, it's also like yeah. a... One of the things we learned while making this is there can be like a real concern, of course, that if the game just continues, will people like will people be attached to the outcomes of these intense rights? And mm -hmm. on one hand, that's solved by the fact that the characters really do want to prevail and they have their reasons for wanting to prevail. And it was also carried by the fact that people, when they're put in, in competitive situations, just just really, really, really want to um, really, really, really want to prevail. Um, and so. Uh, it's it was it was interesting to try and like both tune around that and see what would happen if we allowed if like the narrative allowed for failure and allowed for continuation because um, games tend to work best when your motivation and the character's motivation uh, can either be aligned or they have interesting dissonance for some reason and I think what's been really rewarding about Pyre for for me is that there are moments of both in this um, and I think uh, and I think they come across pretty well. Nice. I uh, I'm gonna dip into the chat real quick here. Um, seems to be there's a. Are you, are you uh, referring to the enigma enigmist character known as Chris Graft? Who's asking questions in the chat? <laughs> there's there's some there's some chat bot named Chris Graft in the uh, chat. He's asking. She's asking. They're asking. How does Supergiant approach the process of polishing a game and finishing it up? Your games always yeah. seem so nice and so glossy. Yeah, that's uh. A brutal uh, dissection. <laughs> we we just like uh, atomize our our video games and reduce them to. You know, it's a lot of playing, and I I think that's just it's a it's a space where our I think our team is is quite comfortable. Like when uh, Amir and I were just talking about this recently, uh, and we talk about it quite a bit. But in the in the later stages of production, although that tends to be like a really busy time during development. There's something very comfortable about it because by then, the design of the game is pretty well understood, and you just kind of see all the problems, and you can go through, you know, pretty systematically and and start to smooth out all those little issues. And it's just our 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 process. You know, it's both formal and informal. But when you get right down to it, it's just kind of like everyone on the team is is able to give feedback and enter tasks and just kind of make observations about what does not feel complete what does not feel you know to use the term polished um and we just try to hammer out all those things as much as possible uh, I, I don't know that it gets uh, too much more uh, complicated than that uh, though though maybe it is from your perspective amir <laughs> uh no i don't know that it, i mean it's just it's a lot of work and uh i think we're yeah. i've heard you say this before greg it's like we're much more i think critical we're our biggest critics in a lot of ways um like in any scene that's being streamed right now i'm sure any one of us <laughs> can find something yeah. they wish they had done something differently but um and and just just because of that i think uh it's just creates a strong attention to detail across across every person on the team in each of their respective crafts um and uh that's part of what's been so good about working with this group is that like uh in some ways one of the things i'm most proud of with the team is that in me a lot of this, a lot of the stuff we do is like running against our own best time. Like the people who work here, they tend to be the only person doing that particular part of the craft. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's really amazing to see them exceed themselves um, over the course of production. Um, and it doesn't always feel like that when you're doing it. Um, um, Cause you are generally so focused on what's left to left to, to do, but um, it can be fun to sort of look back at the early stuff and see see where it's come. 
And that yeah. early stuff is really embarrassing and is not, <laughs> is, not yep. is not polished and does not have any of the qualities that Chris is referring to in his question. Um, yeah. It gets there over time. Uh, you know, uh, we love to ask um, questions that have hot takeaways, right? Like, like what, what advice would you give other devs? What have you learned? What are your biggest challenges? It sounds like um, a lot of your answers to those kinds of questions revolve around the way you structure Supergiant, the way you, you, you make a conscious effort to keep it small and focused. Um, so let's talk instead about how you build that company culture. What do you think is like? What do you think is key to having uh, a small, tightly knit, well oiled working development team? Oh man, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> a, ma- a magical question, right? Like yeah, if only a- if only we all knew, right? Yeah, it's- absolutely. You mean I you think- don't just know? There's not just like a list somewhere. No, I think about this a lot. Like I yeah. I think we have amazing like we have an amazing thing happening here, and sometimes I'm so shocked by it and some like i just don't even want to know sometimes why it works um so i don't it, that's a weird thing to say of course because you should know why it works and should be able to make it better and should be able to articulate it but um i like i really don't i really don't know i don't know what i would tell someone else about how to make a team mm. uh super giant or like the one that they want to make um in in our case is so idiosyncratic to to the relationships that existed before the company you know, came together, like Greg and I and Gavin worked together. I was did a summer internship in Orlando with Andrew, who's the other engineer. You know, uh, Darren and I and Logan and I have been friends for 20 years. Like, uh, a lot of these are old relationships um, that that kind of uh, branched out, met Jen through a friend of a friend, and, and just kind of grew from there. I don't, um, yeah, I don't know... Like what's what's the advice there? No, no people. I don't even know. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, like people. I, it, yeah, it, yeah. it brings it brings to mind something for me that that um, we we would talk about a lot in the particularly in the Bastion days because it would it would just kind of come up a lot. But a thing, um, a thing that I think has been pretty interesting about Supergiant is that like we've never like. As as Amir said, it's just based on these kind of pre-existing relationships and getting a group of people together uh, to make something. It's it's ne- we've never been and and this isn't like a, a criticism of of how this often tends to work, but in our case, we've never like sort of or just about never hired just to kind of fill. We don't like hire to make like a certain game that we want to make. Uh, it, it's it's really about who do we have here and what could we what could we make with the people that we have like um you know that's why we haven't made as i was joking with amir yesterday like i don't know that you can should expect to see like a massively multiplayer first person shooter or something (laughs) from us um not because we don't like games like that but because we're like just not close to being able to make something like that with with the resources at our disposal we're we're we really like the constraints of I, I guess we keep coming back to this we really like the constraints of 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 our small size um, it means that we can make games of a certain scope um, and and not necessarily exceed that but I think we've been able to surprise ourselves uh, and others like pyres uh, by significant margin uh, our biggest game and it's not something where we like strictly set out to make it our biggest game it's just kind of what naturally ended up happening uh, as as a as a byproduct of us wanting to make a multi-character game, and we wanted to make a game that had a big cast where the characters have room to breathe and interact, and and as a result of wanting to succeed in that, um, the game itself got got bigger in a, in a natural way. But it's not like we set out to say, you know, we're going to make a big 20-hour RPG. Let's let's oh, yeah. bring on more, you know, designers and this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. It's it's really about what we can do uh, with the people that we have, and that's been really satisfying over time. Where on the one hand, we're still in our respective roles. You know, the Gen Z is our art director. Logan Cunningham uh, provides voiceover. Darren Corb does our music and and stuff like that. But in with each new game, we've 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 pushed ourselves creatively, like within our respective craft. And I think we all feel like we're we're on these paths where there's like a a never ending amount of challenges and places we could go with it and so on um so that's that's been really i don't think that's advice that's just something that has happened to work uh thus far in our case and we've been around now uh what's it gonna yeah eight years uh is that right amir it will be eight 
in uh, September so, as a studio. Nice. Um, so. I'm going to jump in with a question to yank quickly back to Please. the process of making this game. Um, uh, one of the com- here, thanks, thanks for popping up, Shay. Um, <laughs> Shay is an interesting companion because when you first yeah. meet her, you get the opportunity to remind her what her name is. And yeah. You pick from a long list of words that rhyme with uh, the, le- the the sound a. Um, yeah. Alex, her I name believe- is Bay. Alex insists Bay. she is Bay. Bay is her name. Her name <laughs> is Bay. I don't know why you call her Shay. Um, Very- what I was struck by was, but then you hear uh, Logan Cunningham, yeah. <laughs> old stalwart, saying her name every time she pops into yep. battle. Um, pi- this game is a game that manages a huge amount of different variables at a consistent basis. Um, what are your thoughts about ha- organizing that process? And like, and like, what? I guess like the first question is how do you do it? But I guess the answer is just do it. But like the real answer is like, why is it worth it? And what can you do to make it a sane process? Yeah. Yeah. So, so why, why is it worth it? I like that question a lot because you have answered it by bringing up the detail. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I I think the answer is self-evident. But to like unpack that a little bit more, I, I, I personally, and I think a lot of us like feel strongly that it's the small stuff in games that that really matters like when you think back on your on your all-time favorite games whatever the game that struck you the most when you were 12 years old or something like that like i suspect that what you really remember about that game is like some dumb little detail that that really mattered to you but was not like what the game is about at all you don't you don't remember you know level seven or or whatever in castlevania you remember that the chandeliers swing back and forth and make a creaking sound or something like that as like there's some random Castlevania example. So I think we try to pack our games with with like for lack of a better term like dumb stuff that we get excited about uh, that that is like a little bit excessive or like unnecessary or whatever but it, it's it's flavorful it makes us excited as a team to work on it um, and and we we have found over and over again that uh, players respond well uh, to it also. So that's why it's totally worth it, and we need to get to a place in development where we can, you know, w- where we could justify spending our time that way when there's, like, enough real game there to be able to support uh, the, the small little details as well. Um, and, you know, as to how to make it, like, a sane process, <laughs> I, I have uh, less uh, to say about that, you know. I think we, we do a lot of things, like, ad hoc. I think part of the reason we have little moments like that in development is because we just we try not to stick to too rigid of a schedule or and uh, very could talk about that i'm sure it's just like yeah. not it's not super like we don't like plan for things like well you know next week we're gonna work on yeah. the part where you can rename may to all these different things yeah i mean i think that stuff that feels excessive um that's what's really good about it being small is yeah. um like it all it takes is a couple people to be excited about it, and and sometimes just you, depending on what the particular detail is, and then it gets into the game. Um, and you know, of course, if it's if it's for some reason out of bounds or something like that, uh, someone here will tell you. But it's mostly like, because uh, you only need to get a handful of people excited to actually get something into the game that will ship. Uh, it has a higher chance that those small ideas survive. Yeah. Fewer, right fewer people around to say no, right? Yeah, yeah. That's how we would talk about it. Yeah. There's like a lot of reasons to, I mean, our, our yeah, our games, it's like they, they would not, they wouldn't exist if, if they had to start from a place of like pitch this game to a publisher or something like that. Because they, they just don't even, it, thus far at least, they've just never even started from that place uh, for us, um, uh, for better or for worse, right? Um, so uh, the, the it, it's it's been about our team just, Doing doing the work and having to convince each other, which which can be challenging enough, but it's it's much uh, it's much easier than convincing um, people kind of outside of the environment in which we're making this stuff. Um, we're beginning to run out of time. We have to cut out early today, unfortunately, for our guests here. But I wanted to get some chat questions in now because they are our wonderful viewers who um, have very you know they want to more, learn more about game design. Um, Nito Nerd would like to know what were your thought process behind making a versus mode? Is there anything you wished you could add to it, or is it just a small nice thing for anyone who would like it? Yeah, I mean, I think. Go ahead, Greg. Oh yeah, I, I I was gonna throw it over to you. It was something yeah. like 
uh, you should talk about it with with regard to how it happened so naturally, right? It was yeah. like the way that we were evaluating the game, so it felt really satisfying to turn into a, a real thing. Yeah, yeah, for sure, and I think we 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 just were, you know, we were when it became possible to try and play on the same uh, machine or console against each other, and we started to do it. We saw a lot of potential there. Um, I mean, the game is actually always... We get a lot of questions about multiplayer and stuff. The game has always had its campaign and the experience around that as its main focus. Um, versus mode was sort of an extension of the, of the battle system of the game. Um, and what was so uh, what's so great about it is it's like directly connected to the, to the experience of the campaign. Um, there's even like a spoiler warning, right, before you go into versus mode for people who want to meet all the characters in their campaign context first. Um, before playing it against each other. And I think we're super, super inspired, um, uh, not just by the, the sort of fun we started to have on team, but by by, by old RTS games and stuff, like uh, StarCraft or Command & Conquer, where yeah. you wouldn't even, like, permit yourself to play multiplayer without playing the campaign first because you didn't want, you know, like, a unit spoiled for you or a concept uh, spoiled for you. And, and so that's the thing here. It's like, well, you know, you meet all these characters and you grow to love them and Maybe you spec them in a different way in your in your campaign, but um, but you get to see a representation of, of them here, and you get to you know play with them um, uh, and create sort of dream matchups, dream teams, and dream scenarios uh, that may not occur in the campaign. Uh, put rivals on the team with with some of the Nightwings and stuff like that, and that that kind of I don't know that's just fun from from every angle. It's it's yeah. it's interesting from a fiction angle. It's interesting from from the, the play of it and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. I- Oof, Sorry, Alex, you? I'm going to speed burn through chat questions okay. just to give them a fair shot. Go um, for it. Fiery Sprite asks a question that I think will always have no fixed answer, um, but they ask, how do you guys come up with interesting settings and stories? They're all so unique and colorful. Um, so I, I guess maybe, yeah, just I'll throw that question out and see where it goes. Yeah, I mean, we we sit around uh, in a room and we start <laughs> we start spitballing stuff but yeah I, I i think i kind of uh, alluded to it before but it 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 tends to start with like it can come from any angle there's no it's really hard to we don't have like a process around it i think it's one of those things that's just a byproduct of, of the people that we have uh where um it's so it's so um oh what's what's the term it's this kind of really like symbiotic process. It, it it's a process that feeds off of itself because we'll start with some kernel of something like that. Like like uh, uh, to give an example, with Transistor, our previous game, we were drawn by this idea early on. I think it was like a, a mirror who first vocalized it, but like the idea of like a, a sci-fi love story of like what's something that would feel really different to pursue in an exciting way for us, having just made Bastion. It's like hey, that that does sound pretty interesting, and then we kind of drill deeper into that and we're like well we don't want like laser guns and spaceships type of sci-fi we want (laughs) what we want is like cyberpunk uh, sci-fi but actually we don't even really want cyberpunk sci-fi because we don't want people's like heads getting blown off with magnums and you know (laughs) like like graffiti soaked streets and stuff like that we actually want this really kind of pristine uh like almost like classical setting so we we just talk through it and and we go down this path we start making artwork and music and gameplay prototypes and bits of writing and all that stuff and we we see what sticks and and a lot of stuff doesn't stick and some stuff sticks without us even realizing like we'll create some little piece of content or some prototype thinking that that's not going to be a real thing and then months later we haven't gotten rid of it and we're like hey this is actually kind of working uh, maybe we should kind of build around this instead of replace it um, so uh, we we don't know where where that it's such like an exploratory process for us that we don't know uh, exactly how it's going to go. And it's been very different in some respects on, on all, all three of our games. Something I want to ask, and I understand Greg, if you, if you got to bail early, please just drop the mic and, and, and walk on out of here. But like, uh, the, how has the, how has the, the shifting nature of the indie game market changed the way Supergiant does business, if at all. Right. Ooh. Cause it's hard out there for a lot of developers. Yeah. And, and, uh, but here we are, and we're watching this game. It seems to be getting some critical acclaim. You've got a lot of um, positive fans here in the chat, so you seem to be doing all right. Um, do you guys do any kind of like marketing through streamers or, or traditional marketing, or do you rely on cultivating a, a fan base and really just sort of like rely on that for word of mouth? Yeah, man. So that's a um, it, that's that's a big question, um, and something we like think a lot about. And we 
I think we know that times are pretty different now than when we started in when Supergiant first formed in 2009 like like Twitch didn't exist in 2009 uh, I don't think um, I think like the the iPad had like just come out or something so mm-hmm. um, maybe not even that actually uh, the, yeah maybe the iPad one anyway uh, it's a really different world now and we're certainly aware of that and we try to move we try to keep up with the pace, but I think everybody knows it's hard to keep up with the pace of things these days. Uh, we know that we, um, but yeah, like as far as like like actual like with this particular game, like we knew that we were making a game that is like not I guess like strictly designed for streaming, uh, though we're streaming it right here and now. Um, we we love that people want to stream our games, um, and we're super appreciative of that. But that like. I think you see sometimes you see games that that feel very mu- very modern in the sense that they seem very kind of designed around the act of streaming and the act of spectating. And we knew that we weren't making such a game with Pyre in this particular case. We don't necessarily want to feel completely bound by something like that. We're not, you know, opposed to that as an idea either. It was just like with the particular game we want to make this time, we wanted to see what we could do. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, I think the reality these days is. There's uh, a growing number of excellent games to play uh, in a lot of different places. I think uh, I think that's a really positive thing. Uh, I think that the barrier to entry on making games being low is is absolutely for the best. I love it. It means that just about anybody uh, with an internet connection and time, time being a, a very precious commodity, can hunker down and learn how to make games and and put something out there for free or, or maybe even for sale and just kind of go through that process, go through that learning. And I think that's why there are more better and more like diverse kind of games out there now than there were 10 years ago uh, or even five years ago. Um, at the same time, when there's more great games, it does make it harder for your, for your great game to stand out among the other great games. But that's a good, I think, you know, by our nature as game players, we probably have a little bit of desire to to succeed, uh, having having played other games and stuff like that. Um, so we just yeah, kind of keep keep doing our best, but I we're we're also, still we're still learning. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I was going to say it's like uh, frequently that question, uh, you know, comes from a demoralizing place for some people. It's like, oh my god, there's so much competition. It can yeah. be so hard to hard to get noticed. And what do you do to get your game noticed and this kind of stuff? But um, you know, to what Greg said, it's all of that stuff is no easier now than it was in 2011 or whenever Bastion came out. Um, but it's it's like pretty amazing to like, you know, look at the other games that people were were getting a lot on. You know, I don't know, a place like Steam or something where it's like we're up there and it's Dream Daddy and Player Unknown Battlegrounds and yeah. Counter Strike Go mm-hmm. and like you can't. You can't look at that and be that cynical, right? Because it's like, wow, this is just like a really, this is a really insane set of game content that people are playing and talking about and thinking about and and wanting to buy, um, and that's just kind of awesome. I'm like, I'm really hard to hear you say that because the people that I tend to talk to who are most cynical about that are the people who are running studios. <laughs> oh yeah, no, <laughs> and I have to I, pay. I think... <laughs> yeah, um, no, I'm, I'm excited. Awesome. Uh, I hate to uh, bring this wonderful, both this match and this chat to an end, but I'm afraid yeah. it's time to go. Uh, as I did promise our guests, we would give them time to depart for other tasks. Um, thank you all so much for watching the Gama Sutra Twitch channel. I have been Brian Francis, contributing editor at Gama Sutra. Um, I hate to just end on a pause screen here, but it's a beautiful pause screen. <laughs> um, this has been uh, Greg and Amir, uh, the awesome folks from Supergiant Games, who have made work they worked on pyre which is the game up here and it's available on steam and ps4 right now um alex do you have anything you want to say before you go uh always shave the mustache no no (laughs) no that's it i'm shutting this down right now always don't shave that poor dog's mustache it's beautiful um uh Greg, uh, should we just refer them to the Supergiant Games Twitter feed if they have more questions for y'all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. We're, we're easy to get a hold of these days, I think. Cool. Uh, so you can find them on Twitter at Supergiant Games for more questions about the game. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good day. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.